Welcome. We're so happy to have you here at uh, Davis Community Church for this wonderful event uh, to hear John Deere. Um, I, I'm the interim pastor here at Davis Community Church, Steve Brewer, and uh, I'm here in the official capacity to tell you where the toilets are. <laughs> it's not too hard in this room. They're back through that back door. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to have you here, and I also wanted to acknowledge that this event is, uh, is co-sponsored by Cal Aggie House. So do we have some students, some folks from, from Cal Aggie House? We're really happy to have you here, and thank you for co-sponsoring this event, a wonderful opportunity to hear someone that knows a thing or two about peacemaking. Okay, yeah, if there's a, if there's a seat near you that's available, would you raise your hand? So, okay, look, quite a few seats up here, so don't be afraid to sit in the front pews. And I'd like to introduce Jewel Payne, who uh, helped bring uh, John here, and she's going to say a few words of introduction. Uh, for John. Come on up, Jewel. I'm really happy to see you all here on this beautiful rainy day. Uh, I first, I was introduced to John by one of his books about 13 years ago, which really transformed the way I look at peace. And it was called Living Peace. And he started off with a whole bunch of chapters on topics like solitude, silence, listening, prayer, letting go. And uh, gee, that's not go out and change the world. That's get peace within myself. But he doesn't stop at that either. Um, so one of his... Uh, first things he did when he was a very, very young Jesuit priest was um, they sent him to El Salvador in the middle of a war, 1985, and he was setting up a refugee camp there with bombing and chaos all around and telling the people with the guns to just go someplace else. And he's been in conflict areas in Northern Ireland and in Pakistan and Iraq. And here in this country, he has taken a strong stand for peace in some places where it wasn't very much appreciated, like the Pentagon and the White House and the School of Americas. And he paid the price in prison. Um, and when he, during his time in Washington, D.C., he was working with homeless people there. And in New York, he was the director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is the original peace organization in this country. Um, and he was the director of that. And the current director, we happen to have sitting here someplace, Kristen Stone King, <laughs> back there. <laughs> John was also nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And along with all of these things, he also is the author of 30 books. And uh, through all of his life of nonviolence, his model has been Jesus, along with Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Archbishop Oscar Romero and Dorothy Day. And John, where are you? Are you here? <laughs> Come and talk to us about the nonviolent life. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Jewel, for that warm welcome and, uh, on this beautiful rainy day. Jewel said, I thought there'd be like 20 people here, so I'm just <laughs> happy to have you all here, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for all that you do for peace and justice and, you know, the God of peace and justice in our poor world. I just want to encourage you all to carry on the struggle for justice and peace. It's just wonderful. I'm going around the country uh, talking about my new book, The Nonviolent Life, uh, doing my little bit for peace and all. But, you know, seeing all you lovely, holy peacemakers here in Sacramento, Davis, I'm nervous in front of you. 
I re this reminds me of the true story of the young priest giving his first homily, and he's very nervous, and he comes to the podium, and he taps on the microphone and says, something's wrong with this microphone, and the congregation goes, and also with you. <laughs> so I'm hoping that's not the situation today. That's actually a true story, so that you see. I have other bad jokes if you want to hear them. It's going to be downhill after that, I think. Um, just really happy to be back here in California and so grateful for the, for the rain. I'm just back last week from South Africa. It was so darn exciting. Uh, you know, I'm 54 now and I've been working like you for peace for a long time. For me, about 35 years full time. And uh, I don't know that I could have gotten into South Africa back in the day because of my work. So it was a real holy pilgrimage to go. And uh, so I've been talking with Jewel and I really thank Jewel again for organizing today's event. In fact, and where, I don't know where Pastor Steve went, but I want to thank him and the Com Davis Community Church, the Presbyterian community for welcoming me here. Before I go on, let's have a round of applause for all their hard work <laughs> to bring me here. Thank you, Jewel. Really grateful, Jewel. As I was telling Jewel about my trip, you know, before, and planning today was so incredible. I went to learn about from those who gave their lives in the struggle for justice to end apartheid, you know? And uh, to go to Johannesburg and Soweto, I was surprised. It's kind of like Northern California. It's really beautiful. I mean, I learned, first of all, why they fought for their land, you know? and. Uh, I had had a church in the 80s in Washington, D.C. that was a sister parish with one of the great churches in Soweto. And so it was really thrilling to go there and to see Mandela's house. And, you know, my journey has been so amazing. I was walking down the street, and I literally met, ran into Winnie Mandela. This was about two weeks ago. And um, we had corresponded during the 80s, and she remembered that. And it was so thrilling to see this poor woman who has suffered so much and been totally destroyed, you know, in the struggle. But to see her moving into forgiveness and self-forgiveness and grace. Then we went to Peter Martzburg in Durban. Do you know your South Africa history? Remember the movie Gandhi? The opening scene, what changed his whole life? He's a dopey 21-year-old ki kid, you know, just out of law school. The family says, you're so incompetent. They ship him to South Africa. He gets a case. He buys the first-class ticket but you know, only white people in the first class. He, remember in the movie, he's thrown off the train at midnight in the little town of Peter Martzburg, and he's so scared, and it's freezing cold, he sits on the floor till about nine the next morning. What'll I do? What do we do in the face of systemic injustice? He says, when he stood up, you can read his autobiography, my nonviolence began. So you see, I'm a little over the top, but we went to the train station to make holy pilgrimage. It's the same goofy old Victorian build building from 1893. And went to the platform and went to the waiting room to see the place where Gandhi Jewel began his act of nonviolence. It was so touching. And then in Durban, the, the ashram he founded, which is still there, it was all burned down in 1985 during the, during the apartheid riots. And all. And then we went on to Cape Town and to go to Robben Island and spend a day there, you know, and, and see what he, the great man suffered and all those great people. So touching. And then to have a day with my friend and teacher and our hero, Archbishop Tutu. Um, you know, he's 82 years old now. And one of the first things he said to me, this great, 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 great Mahatma, John, we have no right to give up the struggle for justice and peace. We're going to be about this till the day we die. I pass on that message. The next day he was leaving for Iran, which is no joke. And he's 82. And he's, doing, and, and he's still getting death threats. And, and I said, you know, you're, you're, you may get a chance to see how goofy I am, too. And I said, oh, come on, Archbishop. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> 
how do you, how, he, he's, this poor guy's been getting death threats since he was 13, you know, and he's just speaking out for the poor and for justice across the whole planet. He's the greatest person, maybe. How do you do it? And he looked me in the eye and whispered and said, I cry a lot. And I also laugh a lot. But that's how we live the nonviolent life. And I, I, I had written about that in the book because I've learned so much from him, which is very different from most of us activists here in the States, I think, to really engage our humanity. And Tutu's such a great teacher of that. So I'm very excited to be here with you. And maybe what I could do is, um, if you can stand it, t just tell you some of my stories, talk about the world of violence, talk about nonviolence and the thesis of my book, The Nonviolent Life, and our campaign for nonviolence. And then we, Jewel will have time for questions and answers, and then uh, we'll resolve everything. <laughs> um, and uh, Jewel's got my book in the back, and I have some of my other books, and I'm happy to meet you all afterwards if you'd like. So, you know, so for me, just to tell you, if you don't know about me, you know, I, uh, I, my journey began really just out of college when I decided. You know, I wanted to give my life to Jesus and be really nice and pious. You see, that didn't work. And uh, I thought and thought and thought, and I went to my parents, and I, I, I decided before I did that, I wanted to get to know the lay of the land. So I went, Mom, Dad, I'm going off to Israel for three months to hitchhike on holy pilgrimage to see where Jesus lived. And without missing a beat, my mother was like, where did we go wrong? What he, he had so much potential. And the week I left, Israel invaded Lebanon. Do you remember the, the evil summer war, summer war? Who remembers? Of 1982. It was all orchestrated at the Pentagon. It was all called Operation Peace for Galilee. Run here in the United States. We killed 60,000 people. All the Holy Land pilgrimages were canceled. I walked along completely oblivious from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to Nazareth, trying to be pious, and my goal was to go to the Sea of Galilee, which you've been there, so gorgeous, this big blue sea and the green hills and a blue sky, and I'm just reading the Gospels for the first time, and there's a little chapel in the north part of the sea on a hill called the Chapel of the Beatitudes, and I walk in there, and I'm reading them for the first time, and you know, it's like graffiti on the wall. It said right there, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those persecuted for working for justice. Love your enemies. And not being very bright, I suddenly said out loud in this little empty church, oh my god, I think this guy's serious. never occurred to me. The whole point of Christianity is to live these teachings. That's what he wants. And they're the most political, dangerous, spiritual teachings in all of human history, according to Gandhi, who read the Sermon on the Mount every morning and every evening for the last 45 years of his life, by the way. Our, did I hear some of you are Christians? I'm just asking. I don't, we don't. Wow. This guy, Gandhi, is saying, this is our textbook on nonviolence. You, I want to live a nonviolent life. I have to go read my handbook. So I walk out in the balcony, and I'm going, you know, when you're on goofy, holy pilgrimage, you get even wackier than usual. And I'm talking to God. I'm going, are you trying to tell me I have to live this stuff? Not somebody else? Let's hope. Pastor Steve, you know. But <laughs> we have to do it. And I thought and thought and thought, and I said, okay. <laughs> I was a little over the top. I said, okay, God, I hereby promise to give my life to the Sermon on the Mount in peace and justice. Thank you very much. On one condition. <laughs> if you give me a sign. So that, that was just perfect, because I had found a loophole, because we don't get signs anymore. This was just friend. All of a sudden, there were these loud explosions. And three huge black Israeli jets fell from the sky, swooping down over the Sea of Galilee, breaking the sound barrier, setting off sonic booms, 
dropping a whole bunch of bombs 15 miles away in Lebanon. Changed my life. But there was a part of me that was going, okay, I'll work for peace and I'll never ask for a sign again. <laughs> but you know, and I, I've been talking about that episode because there's, I don't know how you got involved in your work for peace and justice, but I thought, right, well, this, this is really the most important thing. Because for a split second, I did open my eyes, being in a total unconscious daze, and just in case God showed up, and what did I see? The reality of the world, which is sisters and brothers killing sisters and brothers all over the planet. Actually in the name of God. Actually in the name of Jesus. Actually at the place where he said, blessed are the peacemakers, love your enemies. This is incredible. This is the reality of the world. What are we going to do about it? We're going to live these teachings. And that's where, I, that's just, I hit the ground running. And the first, one of the first things I did, this is 1982, was I went and met my great friends and teachers, Daniel and Philip Berrigan. You remember some of you, the Berrigans from the 60s and 70s. Dan is 92 now and very frail. Keep him in your prayers. Well, if you go and sit at the feet of the Berrigans and you're 21 years old, it's like 15 minutes before you have to go get arrested at the Pentagon. <laughs> They're like smoking cigarettes. I go get arrested, kid, and report back. And that's what happened. And I, sh you know, now I've been arrested about 80 times and I'm an ex-con and I can't vote and I can't travel to certain countries and I'm highly monitored by the government and I have a problem with recidivism, so maybe we better not even talk about it. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, trying to do everything we can for peace and justice in this crazy world. And at some point, Gandhi says, you cross the line which legalizes mass murder in our names and you break the law to engage the law you know, with, with symbolic direct action. I went to El Salvador and worked in the refugee camp under the direction of the Jesuits at the university, my friends, the six of them who were later brutally killed in 1989. That's when I was living in the Bay Area and met some of you for four years and was organizing Pax Christi out here. And I remember coming to speak here, Jewel, around 1989 and nearby. And, uh, and that led me to my most notorious crime in 1993 with Philip Berrigan when I walked onto the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina, the home of the F-15E nuclear capable fighter bomber. 10,000 soldiers in the middle of the night Big sign which said, trespassers will be shot on sight. What do you do? Walked on. Came up to one of the big fighter bombers, took out a little hammer, went up to the side of it, and swung one on the fighter bomber. And didn't even chip the paint. As I said to the judge later, <laughs> um, your Honor, I'm just doing what it says in the Bible. I didn't make this stuff up. You know the holy prophet Isaiah said, someday people are going to come along and beat their swords into plowshares and study war no more. That's the holy teaching. And I'm just trying to do what the, you know, Jesus said in his famous commandment in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies, don't nuke them. That's the actual translation from the original Greek. <laughs> That didn't go over with the judge either. I'm trying to make you laugh and it's not working. <laughs> Humor is the only way to get through it. I haven't quite got it yet. But anyway, it was an incredible experience trying to say to the country that our future is dismantling these weapons of mass destruction. They're no good. They're not safe. Anyone can walk onto the base like Sister Megan Rice who's going to be on sentence next week. You know, the 82-year-old nun in Tennessee who's been who's facing 30 years in prison for going into Oak Ridge and our friends. Ours was the 50th of about 100 so-called plowshares actions. And uh, gosh, and we, were, we faced 20 years in prison for that action. And I did about nine months in a little cell about this big and never left the cell with Philip Berrigan. Never went outside, never saw the outside. I was saying in Robben Island that my conditions were worse and the uh, former prisoner who was our guide was saying, actually, we hear that a lot from visiting activists from the states. Um, but I didn't have to work in a lime quarry, and I, only, I got out afterwards and was under house arrest for a year. And it was terrible. You know, and I'm, I'm a big student of Dr. King, and he, you know, we used to memorize his speeches as kids. 
you transform those dungeons of doom and despair into havens of hope and harmony. And I'm looking around the cell going, I don't think so, Dr. King. <laughs> But we took out our Bible and we started with Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We got about three verses into it and we would talk for three hours. And it was like, it was, I learned more in that time in jail than my four years of graduate theological studies at the GTU in Berkeley. Don't tell them I'm saying this, but I'm just saying. It was like the heavens opened up and it was like, this is what I meant here. And then, <coughs> you know, we were given Wonder Bread for breakfast. And then on Mondays, we got a little plastic cup of grape juice, which we found if you hid in the top of the toilet, it ferments quite nicely. <laughs> and we broke the bread and passed the cup, and it was like God was right with us. I'm just saying. <laughs> There's really great blessings to s do foolish, nonviolent things for justice and peace. And I've tried so many things, and it was, you know, seemed to me more happened when I was locked up than everything else I've ever tried combined. Later, I worked with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It's a great group. Uh, Kristen is now the director and um, then became the coordinator of chaplains for the Red Cross after September 11th in New York City. We had about 550 chaplains ministering to 50,000 direct relatives and was working as well at Ground Zero and and at the same time coordinating the demonstrations against the bombing of Afghanistan at Times Square. Well, the church, there was a lot of publicity about me. The church officials didn't like it, and so I got kicked out of New York, and I moved to New Mexico, the poorest state in the country, number one in military spending, number one in nuclear weapons, number one in, well, worst education, drunk driving, domestic violence, suicide, and on and on. There are some 3,000 nuclear weapons at the Albuquerque airport. Meanwhile, at Los Alamos, this hidden place on the top of a beautiful mountain, the birthplace of the atomic bomb, the head where we built the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, business is booming. Obama is trying to rebuild it to make it a state-of-the-art plutonium bomb factory. He's done more for nuclear weapons than anybody since Reagan in 1983. Did you know that? Our Nobel Peace Prize president. Uh, he's competent, you know, competent for war and the system. And so we've had a little peace vigil there every year in Hiroshima Day, and that hasn't gone over too well. But you do what you can. And it's gotten me into a lot of trouble, and um, I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, last year I went to Afghanistan, and it was incredible experience. I went because so few of us in the movement have been able to go, and I was invited. And I learned that two million people have died in Afghanistan in the last 40 years. 10 years with the Russians, 10 years with the warlords, 10 years with the Taliban, and now what? 12 years with us. The war is still going on, longest war in our history. You could say it's the most bomb destroyed place on the planet, some say. It's the worst place to be a woman, perhaps, maybe the Congo. Uh, worst place to be a child. The pollution, unbelievable. Uh, you know, flying in was so incredible. At 4 a.m., the flight left. I was by myself from Dubai going into Kabul. And looking out for an hour over Afghanistan was like the Himalayas as far as you could see. These towering white Hindu Kush mountains. And I remember that joke. You hear John Stewart talking about Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. No one can win a war there. And who was it? I, I don't know. I think it was Genghis Khan who said he wanted to take over the whole world, but nobody can win a war in Afghanistan, so I'll leave them alone in that region. We're so foolish, I thought. How can any, I mean, it's just insanity. But it was weird, because then I look in out, and there's a yellow patch in the white clouds. That was Kabul, and we flew down into it, and as the plane lands, we go into this total gross pollution. And then the mountains disappeared around us. It's so poor. This beautiful city has been so utterly destroyed. These beautiful people. I mean, just use your imagination. There's no running water or plumbing, but it's so crowded now because of the refugees and what we have done. So there's just dust and the human waste in the streets, which turns to dust, which is what everyone is breathing in. You can do the math. It was poverty upon poverty and upon poverty. And to learn and see how the 
hundreds of billions of dollars, which we have poured in that country because we're here to help, has not one penny of it gone to the suffering people, the women and children. Most of it has gone, fled the country so that the politicians can build, you know, mansions in Dubai and so forth and so on. But I met one of the greatest peace groups in the planet in downtown Kabul. These 30 young people, who had each one lost a direct relative from our drone attacks. And they decided to form a peace group in their village. Of course, the government came in and burned down their community house, so they had to flee to Kabul. And one day, they, they uh, wrote to me and Kathy Kelly and Nobel laureates, invited us all to come and be with them. So a couple of us went, and Kathy has been very involved with them. They have, dis they have said, look, we're all going to be killed. Gandhi was right. How do we practice Muslim nonviolence? Let's pursue this with all our energy. They've been memorizing Martin Luther King's speeches in Farsi. Can you imagine these young kids and reading my books? And so on their own, they formed a school for little children, a cooperative for women, 200 women, which we met. They could all have been killed for meeting you know, me, a, a white male from the West. And the kids are doing it. And all they want to talk about is, how do we live the nonviolent life? What does it mean to be nonviolent in such a world? And Mairead McGuire, the Nobel laureate, said to me, I've been all around the world, and I've never met such an incredible, dedicated peace group. I bring that to you and invite you to ponder them the Afghan peace volunteers and the energy, their lives are on the line. And how can we go as deep into the work and life of peace and nonviolence as these kids? There's so many people on the planet are working on. Here's my take on the world, and I, I, don't, I don't know how to even describe what we're going through. So beautiful to be in Davis. I think you have such a beautiful town here. Uh, but it's like a world of, well, Jonathan Shell calls it total violence. I, some days I think we're living in some kind of a zombie movie, you know, like everybody's in this plague of violence. Or we're just all addicted to violence. I mean, of course, we're all for peace. But let's not overdo it, you know. Uh, Dan Berrigan used to joke about we're all pacifists, you know, between wars, <laughs> like being a vegetarian between meals. Um, 30 wars happening today. Uh, 3 billion people in subhuman extreme poverty. The UN says over 1 billion people are malnourished, moving into active starvation. That's such an incredible statistic. Should be the headline every day. A, a billion people are starving. 15,000 at least nuclear weapons still in existence on the planet. Our hatred of the earth and one another that could lead to catastrophic climate change. We're just barreling ahead for it. All of this violence, this global total violence, perfectly normal, absolutely legitimate, meticulously legal, actually quite spiritual. The will of God, you know? And it's inside all of us. We've all drunk the poison. You know, we're all in this toxic mess. It's a, and it need not be that. That's the good news that Gandhi and Dr. King and Dorothy Day and our heroes are teaching us, which you all know uh, and you've been trying to live out, uh, that violence doesn't work. War doesn't work. Violence in response to violence always leads to further violence. It's a never-ending downward spiral. You reap what you sow, the means of the end. What goes around comes around. War doesn't bring peace. War always sows the seeds for future wars, always. Uh, we have to break the cycle of violence, non-cooperate with violence in the culture of war, and try to give birth to something new, become sober people of nonviolence. Really, if we're addicted to violence, then this is just a, a glorified 12-step meeting of Violence Anonymous. I'm, hi, I'm John, I'm addicted to violence, and I'm your speaker, and we're going to make restitution and turn to our higher power and try to become sober, though we're sick. 
But to talk about the word love, I don't know. I find the word is so co-opted. Or the word peace. Everybody's for peace. That's why I use this clumsy word from Gandhi and Dr. King, nonviolence. And I invite you to use it. And that's why I wrote this book about it. You know, I, I think it hasn't been quite co-opted yet because it just says there's no violence. But, of course, it means much more than that. It's a very poor word, I grant you. But how do you define it? What does it mean? And if Gandhi were here, he'd say, how can we become people of nonviolence? That's the question. I invite you, as I'm reflecting with you, to think about your life. Where are you on the journey of peace on the road of nonviolence? How has your life been a story of violence from your youth through the culture of war? I don't know, World War II to w Vietnam to Iraq or racism and sexism, all the forms of violence that we're all coping with and trying to survive. And how have you turned and tried to non-cooperate with violence and become more and more a person of nonviolence? Here's how I define it, if you're with me. Nonviolence, if you will, is a vision of the heart that looks out upon the whole human race, so beautiful, sees every human being on the planet is your very sister and brother. All 7.2 billion of us are one, already reconciled, already united, already living in the gift of peace that was given long ago. If you go deep into the spiritual truth of reality of our common unity, that we're one even with all creatures and all of creation, all of us, sons and daughters of the God of peace. It's such a great thing. You can never hurt anybody ever again. It's your sister and brother. Much less kill somebody or be silent and passive when there are 30 wars, 15,000 nuclear weapons, a billion people starving, catastrophic climate change, dare I go on. There's nothing passive about this life. The work of peace, the life of nonviolence, is active love, pursuing the truth of our common unity, giving all we have for the human race, reconciling every human being, resisting every structure and system of violence with all our love, allowing the God of peace to disarm our hearts of the roots of violence within us, that we can be channels of disarming love. From this day forward, practicing unconditional, non-retaliatory, all-encompassing, all-inclusive, universal love. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, you're thinking, this guy's had too much coffee. I could, and I just get excited about that. But there's just one catch with all of this nonviolence. And this is where you're going to disagree with me. There is no cause, however noble, no matter what they tell us again for the rest of our lives, for which you and I will ever support the taking of a single human life ever again. The days of killing are over. The days of violence have to be over too. So Gandhi says nonviolence is the power of God, the way of love and truth that's more powerful than all the weapons of the world combined. And we've just begun to tap into it, like Edison experimenting with electricity. We missed all of Jesus' teachings, but actually this is a very exciting time to be alive because the world is waking up. It has to about the potential of nonviolence. You remember what poor Martin Luther King said the night before the government killed him. April 3rd, 1968, Memphis. The choice is no longer violence or nonviolence, Martin said. That's not what we're talking about. Well, then what? Nonviolence or non existence? Unless the whole human race becomes nonviolent now, the Holy Prophet told us we are doomed to our self destructive violence. That's what we're seeing play out in the newspapers every day. We have a responsibility. But it's our. Tutu, oh gosh, Tutu was saying to me last week, John, we have to keep working because our sisters and brothers around the planet are suffering and dying. That's active nonviolence. Well, I've been trying to figure this out and talk about it my whole life, and I can't quite get, grasp it. And uh, how do you make it simple? So I've come up with a thesis, and I, this book, The Nonviolent Life, is really the culmination of my w life's work. And it has a simple little thesis which I want to propose to you and see what you think about. 
that nonviolence requires three simultaneous attitudes at the same time. First, you have to be nonviolent to yourself. Okay. While you're doing that, you have to second practice meticulous interpersonal nonviolence, nonviolence toward every human being on the planet and all creatures and all of creation. While you're doing that, third, you also have to be part of the grassroots global movements of nonviolence. Well, I can see that didn't go over too well. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Because uh, my experience is that we, a lot of us make it to one or two of those, but very few reach Archbishop Tutu's level of all three. That's what Gandhi and King and Dorothy Day are calling us to. Like, we might be really nice people, pretty peaceful, pretty peaceful in our families, but we're not involved as our sisters and brothers are dying around the world. That's not nonviolence. That's not peacemaking. That's passivity. Dare I say, Merton would have said, complicity with the structures of killing around the world. On the other hand, there's a lot of us who are really involved, and we're mean angry, uh, determined activists for peace. <laughs> That's not going to work either. I, you know, this is a holistic thing. It's a whole, a whole ball of wax we need to embrace. It's the easiest thing in the world, and it's the hardest thing there is, and that's why nobody's talking about it. This is the spiritual life. This is the purpose of the church. Jesus was the embodiment and epitome of nonviolence, Gandhi said. Everything he taught and lived was about nonviolence, and the churches have pretty totally rejected that, you know, these last 1,700 years, even come up with the just war theory. But you and I now are saying, no, we're going to go back to that life. So if you can stand it, I just want to say a word about each one of these three things, and then about the campaign, and then we can have some comments and questions. So, and there ref these are reflections for you as people on the journey to peace. First of all, how are you doing with being nonviolent to yourself? And how can you be more nonviolent to yourself? In other words, how do you make peace with yourself? What's going on inside of you? It's very powerful. And I'm talking about ending war. This is the political implications of our interior lives. This is very interesting stuff. Gandhi was doing postdoctoral research and in nonviolence, read Thomas Merton. Oh my God, his sentence about Gandhi still knocks me out. I don't think I even understand it. Gandhi's nonviolence was the fruit of an inner unity already realized. What? How did he think that through, Merton? No, Merton goes, you activists, you are trying to reach an outer unity, and later you'll work on your own. Gandhi followed Jesus, if you see what I mean, and disarmed his heart that he was doing that. So I love what Thich Nhat Hanh says, the great teacher. Just look deeply within. That's so gentle. Now, the way I see it is we're all wounded. We're all victims of this culture of violence. And if you're going to be working for peace and justice, you've got to be really conscious of what's going on inside. So what happened to you? You know, it's really important for this work to go, how were you a victim of violence from your parents, your siblings, other school kids, your youth, or the culture, the Vietnam War, wh whatever? How, what happened to you? And how can you be consciously working on your healing? Um, and, and, you know, because what happens in this culture of violence is you, you leave the peace conference and you're driving down the street and they cut you off and you want to kill them but that's because somebody said something to you or you're still struggling with what your father did to you when you were three. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you and I want to be really centered and mindful because after that happens, then you want to beat yourself up. I shouldn't have done that. I'm such a, you know, we have low self-esteem and self-hatred. I've thought a lot about this because the Dalai Lama is now talking about it. He's saying the people of the United States are full of self-hatred and he didn't even know what that was until the last few years. Because most, a lot of people in the world don't have that. We're sick with violence. You and I want to be people of peace. We have to be doing our inner work. So my question is, how can you let go of your inner non, inner violence, and cultivate 
if you will, interior nonviolence, to be really gentle to yourself, really nonviolent to yourself, not beat yourself up. Just go, why did I do that? Why do I have these feelings? And to be really conscious. Gandhi, I have this quote at the beginning. It's a shocking quote. The life of nonviolence uh, is the highest level of conscious living. Wow. This is what Thich Nhat Hanh is talking about in mindfulness. We want to be so centered in peace that we really begin to cultivate the mystical depths of peace within us, to dig out the roots of war within each one of us. And the only way to do that is through meditation and prayer and taking time with the God of peace. This is so nice because God is just so wacky in love with us. And we think God is violent, but the scandal is God is nonviolent. God is peace. God is love. God is nonviolence. And the thing to do in your quiet time every day, which is the beginning of peacemaking, you have to do it, you let go of your violence. Give all your anger, your hurts, your wounds, your bitterness, your vengeance to the God of peace and the Holy Spirit of peace and let the God of peace give you that gift of peace that you and I can radiate personally the peace we seek politically. And when you do that, you discover just how loving and nonviolent God is. And then you come to a new definition of nonviolence, if you're still with me. Nonviolence is remembering who we already are. The beloved sons, the beloved daughters of the God of peace. How wonderful life is. The minute you forget that, I don't know who I am. I'm crazy. You're into mindless violence. Well, you're not my brother. I can be mean to you. And who the hell cares about the children of Afghanistan or Iraq or a billion starving people? Because we forget. Violence is forgetting. It's like we're in a culture of al Alzheimer's now or amnesia. The life of nonviolence, the practice of contemplative nonviolence is remembering where we are in the universe story. And it's so beautiful. Okay, while you're going deep into interior nonviolence, secondly, you're practicing perfect, meticulous, interpersonal nonviolence. I can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> <gasps> you know, the minute I'm not an expert in nonviolence, I'm an expert in violence because I'm, you know, and I'm American. I, I don't need to mention I'm a white male church person. Let's not even talk about that. Um, you know, because the minute I think, I really got this down, thank you very much. You know, then you go and do something totally goofy and horrible. It's like one step forward, ten steps back. I invite you to reflect, how are you doing in your life of nonviolence with the people around you? beginning with your family, your relatives, your coworkers, the people at church. Who's the person who pushes your buttons most? The most difficult person in your life. The one that you feel, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's really nice, but I sure wish, you know, you could get that guy. That's your teacher of nonviolence. You're so lucky. <laughs> you know, really, because those people expose your violence. You need them. Isn't that strange? And they are the ones we really get to reach out with a little extra unconditional love and experiment. What's going on with me? Why is that? Why do I not want to love that person? And it's not talking about liking people. Martin Luther King talked about that. It's very interesting. But unconditional nonviolent love is the requirement of, hum of our humanity. And um, so, you know, and, and then when someone threatens us, how are you going to respond nonviolently? Have you done your homework and learned the methodology of nonviolent conflict resolution? That you don't need to live in fear and you don't have to respond with violence. You can respond nonviolently because nonviolence is infinitely creative and Gandhi says it always works. Are there any questions? Uh, I, I believe that, and I've been trying to experiment with it full time. That's largely why I've worked so much in soup kitchens and shelters and prisons and war zones. I put myself in those positions and find God is right there with you. If you do what the Sermon on the Mount teaches, offer no violent resistance to one who does evil. Love your, even your enemies. While you're doing that, practice even, even nonviolence to all the animals and beautiful creatures God has given us to the beautiful creation 
instead of being part of the destruction of the earth, saving the earth. At the third, we have to also be part of the global grassroots movement of nonviolence. The world is moving, friends. The world is waking up to nonviolence. It has to, and it's happening. And you won't read about it in any papers in the United States. Walter Wink said, two-thirds of the human race in the last 30 years are personally involved in grassroots movement of nonviolence. This is exciting. There have been 85 nonviolent revolutions in the last 30 years. I wrote about this book that came out from Columbia University two years ago called Why Civil Resistance Works. And these big time social scientist scholars, I didn't understand much of it, it was all charts and graphs, set out to prove why Gandhi was wrong, that this couldn't work. So they studied like 386 revolutions from 1900 to 2006 and found by and large everything that was nonviolent worked. I mean, go read the book, Why Civil Resistance Works. It's incredible. Gandhi was right, and dare I mention Jesus. Um, you just don't hear about this. You know, from the fall of communism in the Berlin Wall to the end of apartheid to, say, the singing revolution in Estonia. And to me, the, uh, the greatest living peacemaker is Lima Gaboi, this incredible woman from Liberia. Uh, she won the Nobel Peace Prize three years ago. I hope you all know about her. If you don't, you need to do your homework. There's a whole movie about her called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. You know, Charles Taylor killed 200,000 people in Liberia. I mean, really brutally. And she had a dream, and Lima wakes up in the morning and says, well, I just can't take this anymore. I'm going to call upon all the women of Liberia to just sit down and say we've had enough. And she did, and they did, and he left. They just took to the streets, w put on white clothes, sat down, and said, uh, no, we've had enough. And she's like, well, they're going to kill us anyway. We might as well die saying no to it. And uh, it's, this, this works, but it's scary. You just have to try it, which means we have to keep moving, keep organizing, keep taking risks, keep building the global grassroots movement, and that's what I urge you to do. For all of you who've been involved in the movements over the years, thank you, thank you, thank you. And carry on, as, as Archbishop Tutu said, with all the love and good cheer you can. If you're not, get involved. I love what Romero said the day he was killed. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Pick an issue. Don't have to do everything. What stirs your heart? The environment? Stopping the war in Afghanistan and nuclear weapons? That's what's churning me. Immigration? Ending this death penalty in California? <sighs> Gangs? All these types of violence. Pick one struggle. Learn. Go and meet people. Get involved. Join the peace and justice groups here in Davis. Start one your own. Uh, and and be part of the movement. So my friends and I have launched Campaign Nonviolence. We've written and contacted every major peace group in the country to try to reignite the movement. And we're calling everybody, in Ken Buttigan's words, to mainstream nonviolence, like Gandhi and King did. Let's talk about it again. Lift it up in our family lives, our churches, our schools. How can we create Davis as a really nonviolent community? How can we help California become more and more nonviolent? You live in one of the most important places in the world. You have a lot of power and responsibility, and you can do even greater things. How can we help the country and the world become more and more nonviolent? So we're calling for trainings with Engage and studying my book. And in the fall, at beginning on Peace Day, September 21st, through the congressional elections, we're looking for 300 demonstrations around the country coordinated under this umbrella. Um, and we're asking people just to pick one of the three themes that is moving to you. F uh, war, whether like the drones, a lot of people working on ending drones, and or poverty, such as homelessness or global hunger, and or the environment. As we're working with 350.org and Bill McKibben and all uh, about this tar sands pipeline. And to, we're calling for people to take to the streets, to march here in Davis and Sacramento in the spirit of nonviolence and to say no and to be heralds of a new world of peace. I'll just uh, end with a story from my great friend Howard Zinn. He was the author of this great book, maybe you all read it, People's History of the United States. Incredible story. He, you know, he died a couple years ago and he said to me, just before he died, we were having lunch. You know, I've been working my whole life on the history of these movements. 
And I finally realized after 40 years, they all have one thing in common. Think of it. The abolitionists. Crazy people, like they're going to end slavery. The suffragists, those uppity women. The labor movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the beginning of the environmental movement. Howard Zinn said they all were from beginning, middle, right to the very end, hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. I said, thanks a lot, Howard. That's really encouraging. And then he said, and I, I realized then there was a breakthrough. And I asked, why? And I realized they had one more thing in common. In every case, historically, we know now, change happens from the grassroots, bottom-up movement building, from Jesus to Gandhi and King, when good, ordinary people keep at it every day, doing what they can for justice and peace, doing their one or two or three things a day, knowing even they may not live to see the outcome they seek. And they keep at it anyway for the future. That's when nonviolence kicks in and becomes contagious, and the powers know it, and the movement has already won. Dear friends, thank you for all you do, and keep on doing it. God bless you. Thanks for listening. So we have some time for question and answers, and a friend has a, a microphone. But maybe we've resolved everything, I'm thinking. Maybe you could give us a few hints or something, some things that you do to work on your personal inner peace. Was there another question out there somewhere? <laughs> So thank you. That's really great. You know, it's a struggle for me, you know. Uh, but that's life. That's the spiritual life is the struggle. Um, in my life and my training, uh, you know, I was taught early on to take quiet time every day. And so that's what I do first and foremost. And, you know, it's always shocking to me. I, you know, I, M Mother Teresa said you had to spend three hours a day in prayer. Gandhi spent two hours a day. And he was, these are very busy people. Dare I say they might even be busier than us. I'm just, I'm thinking, maybe. <laughs> Gandhi gets up at four in the morning for an hour and five o'clock in the evening for an hour and sitting in silence. I, I went with Arun Gandhi to, to where Gandhi lived in India to see it for myself. I was trained to do 30 minutes of meditation every day, and I do it at the beginning of every day, and usually in the morning. But, um, and you know, the reason, as I said, we don't want to do it is because our junk comes up, you know? There's always something, always something going on. And, um, you know, I, my, as you see, my level of peacemaking and prayer is about a fifth grade at best. It might be first grade. So, and I'm a Christian, so I sit down with the nonviolent Jesus. Now, I'm just telling you. Now, I, I think Jesus is completely opposite of everything the culture has made him to be. He, he's more gentle and nonviolent than Thich Nhat Hanh. I'm just saying. Or Gandhi, you know, he's just real. But we think of him as angry and going in and turning over the tables. You know, when you do civil disobedience, you're really centered. You're less angry than ever. That's my, otherwise it's not nonviolent. I've done a lot of big actions, and you have to walk really peacefully to do these things. So I s pretend I'm with Jesus, and I tell him my problems. You wouldn't believe what's going on. These people are mad at me. These people are mad at me. I'm having a terrible time. I don't feel so well. And he goes, oh, you're doing just fine. I really love you. And I go, oh, you say that to everybody. <laughs> and I always feel better. You know, I read this theologian once. I'm trying, I mean, we're, we're just inventing this. I mean, it's really, I mean, it, we're only into 50, 60 years of talking about nonviolence. We talked about love and peace, but Gandhi's got somewhere, and then Dr. King. So we're, the world is, there's a lot of hope. Um, but one, so we, we, I'm even talking about the spirituality of nonviolence and the theology of nonviolence. That's why I wrote a book called a theology, uh, The God of Peace Toward a Theology of Nonviolence because I couldn't find any. I'm trying to figure this out myself. 
that Jesus has no violence in him. Now, that's an extraordinary statement to make. It's like, you know, I don't know how to describe it, a glass with some dirt in it. We all have sludge, you know, in us, but his is clean water. That's why if you just touch him, you feel better because there's no violence in him. And, and he, he heals us of the violence. So I feel disarmed in meditation. But the, if when I don't do that, I'm still living in my mindless violence. So this contemplative vi nonviolence, it actually, as Gandhi said, becomes a matter of life and death for you. It's the only way. But that's the beginning. Then you need friends. Uh, we all need friends, but like-minded friends who care about peace and justice. And you have to have a community, a peace group of some kind. Of course, it should be the church. Every church should be talking nonviolence morning, noon, and night and trying to end all war and poverty and nuclear weapons. That's what the point is, to welcome the kingdom of God, which is perfect nonviolence, no more death. Um, but you, the minute if you're on your own, you end up watching CNN and watching the bombs fall and going, isn't that, that's just too bad. There's nothing that can be done. And that's not good. Uh, you need a group of people, friends, a little peace group, a peace group within your church group. I have communities within communities within communities. You don't want to know. It's not pretty. Um, to support me, to help me. And I'm doing, you know, things all the time. I would say thirdly, uh, I'm a big believer in public action for peace and justice. Uh, as Dan once told me, the only way to be hopeful is to do hopeful things. You know, it gives your life infinite meaning if you're organizing. We organize these simple vigils in Los Alamos. Like, yeah, I mean, taking on the nuclear weapons industry. And there's only a handful of us usually. But gosh, they put it on the front page of the paper. The whole state is talking about it, and I get death threats. And it's so small. I mean, you just don't know. This is what my friend and our, our friend Pete Seeger talked about, who just died. And, and you know, maybe you heard that interview on Democracy Now! He <laughs> there he was telling for him the most important parable, the parable of the sower. And that was his image of his life. And that's the way I think we are as peace and justice activists, sowing seeds of peace and nonviolence knowing that some will land on good soil and bearing good fruit. So letting go of the outcome, trying not to be obsessed with results and making a difference, just being on this journey of peace and nonviolence, walking with Jesus or your image of the God of peace with a lot of friends and moving as great as forward toward love. So I, I'm trying to move then away from anger and away from fear and away from crazy behavior, and away from being mean and violent. And I say those words very decidedly. I think in the churches, there's a lot of mean people, you know? And uh, I see that just we're just mirroring the religious authorities of the gospel. What happened when you, when you want to get in with God and you get some power, especially among men, but I don't think it's limited to men, you can really go crazy. And uh, you know, I don't want that. So I, those are some thoughts. Uh, I, I study and write a lot. I'm trying to stay attentive to that. And I, I'm doing different things. A couple years ago, I finally gave up television. You know, and I'm trying to go deeper. I've been a vegetarian for 35 years. I always try to be in trouble with the government. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very helpful. And with a government that's planning the destruction of the planet to be in resistance to them. And um, so that means I'm always just coming out of court, jail, under probation, in some kind of legal trouble since 1982. It's a life in res of nonviolent resistance, which often people don't know about. You know, it's very strange to be at home. I, I've been living in a very remote place in the desert, off the grid, no drinking water, tin roof, really, really remote, but spectacularly beautiful. And to have, you know, government police find you, raid, raid the house, that happens to me, things like that. Um, I feel like, you know, I'm doing my job. So I'm on the journey like you. Thank you.
thanks for the talk, John. It was very helpful. Oh, um, and um, you know, I want to hear your reflections on the fact that a lot of the power in the current world is actually held by multinational corporations, and a lot of the tactics that we use in the peace movement are aimed at the government, as you were just talking about, mm. and what your thoughts about how can we uh, provide that same resistance to what um, the multinational oil companies are doing to the climate uh, so that we can change this pell-mell race to destruction that we're all involved in. Thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm, you've already answered the question, you know, in that we have to do that. And some people, especially young people, are doing that. I, I, I like to think of the Occupy movement is doing that. The 350.org movement is doing that. Um, I'm having a senior moment, but the movement in Seattle 15 years ago at the World Trade, what? WTO. The WTO movement was a step in the right direction. We're just beginning, I think, you know? There's so much to do. Um, and, you know, I maybe could say different things in this corporation and that corporation. Gosh, I was in India a couple years ago with Vandiva Shiva, Van, Vandiva Shiva, the great, maybe the greatest environmentalist on the planet. And she'd spent a day talking about what Monsanto is doing, you know, stealing and uh, all the seeds of the planet eventually and changing all seeds. And she's illegally storing them in India so that we can continue a civil disobedience when that day comes. And she was saying, well, why would the world needs to work on Monsanto? But we could go down the list of corporations, you know, that are bringing such evil. Uh, I, I just keep saying what I, I hope I've been saying, that in the end, life on the journey of peace is a matter of discernment. There's all goods to be done. It's all good, the, the matter of resistance. But what is the one that you and I should be doing? And that means really reflecting on our lives. How can we non-cooperate with such corporations and with the culture of violence and the systems of war? So for me, that has meant moving off the grid and to solar panels and, uh, the w you know, where I live, the water can't be drunk because it's full of hexavalent chromium and it's radioactive. You know, it's New Mexico. It should be just closed. Same with Nevada. And, uh, but it's changed my life, wow, to be living so close to the earth. I've got coyotes I like know by name now. <laughs> and it's it was so much more fun. Um, to uh, getting together with your group here in Davis and examining that question. What's the job to be done here? You know, how can we, it, which, you know, is there a corporation that we should be protesting here? Or following the leads of the national movements. But, you know, that I think s in the last few years, people were spending so much time resisting Bush, they just completely were collapsed and got burnt out. And then a lot of people mistakenly put all their energies into Obama. And I certainly didn't. It's, very, it's a great benefit not to be able to vote. It clarifies your relationship with the government. <laughs> trying to make you laugh still. Uh, <laughs> and then people burned out as we saw what the Obama administration is doing. So that's why we, we were talking very generically about campaign nonviolence saying, you know, pick some area around the country, but let's all take to the streets this fall and engage in some public action. I'm sorry to be so vague, you know, I have a very close friend who, who spent a lot of time resisting Walmart, for example, to friends who work on Wall Street resistance. Um, and we could kind of go down the list. I, I'm just holding up this bigger vision of nonviolence, and I, I, I always hesitate to tell people what to do, except to say, pick something and do it. And I'll just say one other thing. I say that because, um, you know, it's a lifelong struggle bigger than all of us, and we're trying to build up a grassroots movement. And shortly before he died, I was with Cesar Chavez, and I said to him, if I'm ever with people and they ever say to me, what should we do, what should I say? And without missing a beat, Cesar Chavez said to me, tell everybody for the rest of your life, he went like this, public action, public action, public action. This is very exciting. 
It sort of doesn't matter because all the issues are connected. They're all one. Just take to the streets and take some public action spirit of nonviolence. Have we resolved everything finally? Do we? Uh, maybe one last one here. Um, I know it's really warm in here. Someone's been talking way too much. You've all been very nonviolent. I just want to say that for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everything, John. Uh, I w attended a Sabeel conference in Sacramento uh, a year ago, March, and became conscious of the boycott, divest movement against Israel's apartheid. I tro totally admire the Methodist and Presbyterian churches for moving towards divesting. Of course, the Catholic Church, as usual, has avoided the issue. And I mean, we, as a result of the conference, did, we do have money. We found a broker who does socially conscious investing where she really examines the ec um, ecological issues in her investments. That's a small step. Uh, she, you know, she assured us that nobody's 100% clean if they're investing, and we understand that. But, you know, you cannot own the soda stream. You can talk about the makeups that are built on Palestinian land. You can divest from corporations like Samsung and Caterpillar, which are, uh, and uh, Raytheon, which are doing the uh, checks in Israel and, uh, and some of the destruction of Palestinian lands and so on. So there's, uh, most of us have some money to invest and, and that's, we can try to educate ourselves. Our work is really very imperfect, but it is at least we're trying to move in the direction of being more aware. I just wanted to bring your response to something more specific. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I just want to ask you to hand the mic back to her. The name of the, the website about the boycott divestment movement, it's bds.org? Yeah, yeah, is that so. it? Yeah, and there's Sabil, uh, which is the support group. Fosna. So I hope everybody heard her. She's talking about the boycott and divestment movement for Israel in terms of one way to breaking the occupation of the Palestinians. And so, you know, I thank you for raising that. I, you know, trying to do my little part, been going regularly to Israel and Palestine to meet and be with nonviolent Israeli peacemakers and nonviolent Palestinian peacemakers to encourage them. That's what I've been trying to do over the years. Once we were a group of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. This is very dangerous. And committed to nonviolence, we had a couple of rabbis, a couple of imams, and even a Catholic priest. Two out of three ain't bad, no. Um, so everywhere we went, everybody was mad at us, or somebody was mad at us, and someone could respond to each sector. It was so beautiful, and we learned so much. But a friend, I was over in, um, at the Sabil conference, I think it was two years ago. I was invited to speak to the Palestinian peace movement, if you will, me and all these wonderful people, the Cardinal of Jerusalem, the Archbishop from South Africa. And I tried to get out of it because I, I don't like to go around the world and tell people what they should be doing. The last thing we need is more Americans doing that or, God forbid, white male church people. But I go and listen, which is what I was trying to do in Afghanistan and Iraq and Central America. But they really went after me. And we said, no, we really want to hear about what's happened in the U.S. and what do you think about nonviolence as a requirement for resistance. And it was so powerful and moving. So I hope you all know this group, uh, Sabil. And they have a great website, fosna.org, F-O-S-N-A.org, Friends of Sabil, North America. If you're wondering what to do, I if you're in the churches and all, that's a good group to get with. Jim Wallace and I and Archbishop Tutu are very involved with them. I really, really love them. There's many, many good people. But, you know, I keep coming back with you after many trips over there and my friends who go there regularly, my relatives go there trying to help and saying the problem is here. The problem is here. It's around the world, but it's especially here in the United States. Um, you know, we're not anti-Semitic. We're pursuing the Jewish vision of shalom. We're pursuing human rights for Palestinians and children. We want to end up the occupation and, and return it to what could be a beautiful nonviolent land of peace. But it involves everything. 
Syria, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, all of these, and the U.S. is involved everywhere trying to destroy, I think, a lot of people in a lot of places very, very consciously, deliberately burning places down to take over the world and continue to hold our grasp on the world. I say that because Dick Cheney actually said that. He really did. And uh, I, I mean, I could go on and on about that because I studied it. I was so shocked. He said, everything is about the great war to come with China. Yeah. And so these, these things are very conscious decisions about oil and controlling territories. For They are totally well aware of climate change and planning for 50 years from now. Uh, and so the boycott divestment movement is critical of cutting the funding that uh, makes the occupation uh, possible. I can say that because Tutu and Jimmy Carter said, I mean, it's hard to hear Tutu saying that the situation of Palestinians is worse than apartheid in South Africa. But, in, and forgive me for being such a name dropper, I was with Harry Belafonte recently, and he said uh, that Mandela told him secretly that they could have tried everything under the sun, but it was the nonviolent movement from around the world, especially the boycott that ended apartheid. Uh, that is what has to happen here. A lot of friends, especially Code Pink and Medea, are working on demonstrations at APEC. You know, that's really going to have to be a key thing, too. Well, you all know all this, so I'm just trying to encourage you. We're talking about a real spirit of nonviolence and solidarity with all these different peoples and struggles. Um, maybe that's a, a note. Um, so, uh, friends, I'm going to be happy to meet you all and sign books. And I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get two copies of each. <laughs> no, I, it's been such a pleasure to be with you all, and keep me in your prayers, and carry on the journey. You're doing great. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Well, we don't want this to just be the end of our study of nonviolence and go back to life as usual. So, um, uh, we have s uh, several possibilities for follow-up, um, and if you're all going to read John's book, we wanted we have some sheets where if you're interested in signing up and reading it with a group, talking about it with a group, um, you can sign up on that. There also is a sheet to sign up if you want to be in the Engage Nonviolence training. This is a 12-session uh, study that was done by Pache Bene. Uh, so those are two possibilities for follow-up study. And I want to mention some events. Where did, uh, oh, Kristen, can you take the microphone to Kristen? There's an event coming up that Kristen will tell you about that is uh, planned by Fellowship of Reconciliation. Thanks, Jewel. Uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation is sponsoring with the East Point Peace Academy uh, two-day nonviolent intensive training on uh, April 5th and 6th. And it's done on a gift economy, which means that whatever you can afford, that's what you're encouraged to pay. Uh, it's going to be amazing, and um, I really want to encourage everyone to, to think about it. it. There is limited space, but if it looks like we have, um, you know, more than we can handle, we'll, we'll co-sponsor again with the East Point Peace Academy. So um, it was really such a blessing to hear John talk, and, um, you know, he talked about Gandhi, and he talked about South Africa, and one of one of the things Gandhi did in South Africa was to set up two two multi-faith communities, Tolstoy Farm and Phoenix Settlement. So I really uh, want to especially encourage students at the multi-faith living community to come to this nonviolence training because Gandhi knew that um, multi-faith community and the wisdom that's found in multi-faith living and multi-faith tradition and the reconciliation that's needed for those communities to flourish are the, the roots of, of a nonviolent life. So uh, students living at the multi-faith living community here in Davis, we need you. We need you to come to this intensive training because we need your experience and we need 
your voice and your presence. And, and in fact, everybody, we need you. Um, I, I still live in Davis. A lot of people think I, I moved to New York, but we, <laughs> we decided to continue to, to stay in Davis. You're all my community. And I'm so proud that we had, uh, it looks like 200 people come out on this rainy Saturday to, to invest in living a nonviolent lifestyle. It's a capacity. And we, we grow it, we sustain it through each other. And by doing intensive trainings, um, by, by showing up regularly to groups and actions. So uh, there are, there are sign-up sheets on the back table. I'm happy to talk with anyone about the intensive training coming up or any other aspect. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, Kristen. This is the flyer about it. And there's one on both, there are several on the front and the back tables, if you're interested in that. A couple of other things that are coming up. The Meta Center for Nonviolence, uh, which I think is affiliated with Fellowship of Reconciliation now. And Michael Nagler is the director of that. They're having a discussion on their a conversation, that's what they're calling it, on February 27th in Berkeley. And uh, to they're trying to tie together different peace movements and just bring people together to work together. So if anyone's interested in that, I have information on that. And um, the Ecumenical Advocacy Days in Washington, D.C., are a very large gathering that happens every year. Uh, it's March 21st to the 24th this year, where they train people in advocacy techniques. They have workshops on all different aspects of peace and nonviolence. They look at environmental things, social justice, food justice. They have workshops on numerous different parts of the world. Um, so those are some things that are coming up. And so I hope we can keep working together. Yes. I can't, but I will ask someone else to. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, the book 